Welcome to Terror in Tandem's second annual Act Terror Fest. All month long, we'll be celebrating the horrifying delights of the spookiest month, October. Prepare yourself for episodes that frighten and delighten your spine as we chill you to the bone. You can find us on our new YouTube channel, Terror and Tandem, or online at terrorandtandem.com and on Instagram at Terror and Tandem. Welcome. Welcome to Octerrorfest. Yay. Oh, we're going to have such a spooky, tacular, spectaculacrum. We're going to have all of the. Did you just say speculum? No, spectaculum. Ah. Spectaculacrum. Well, get in the stirrups, everyone. We're going to town. No, I didn't say speculum. Ah. I said spectaculacrum. Of course. Of course. Welcome to Octerrorfest Volume 2. The return of Octerrorfest. Yeah, Octerrorfest all around you. I am so excited. We're going to terror all over your face. Now listen, <laughs> here's the thing. I want to, if I could, beloved co-host, I want to talk for a second about why we are doing the episode we're doing today. And it's to address some of the Concerns we've been hearing from our literal billions of listeners who have been uh, writing and, and texting us just nonstop about, well, a phenomenon I think is, is common to a lot of us. You know, you, you, you go to bed um, in your own home, comfy in your, in your sleeping clothes, and you wake up naked in, a, in the middle of the woods um, with blood in your mouth, and there's a dead deer next to you with its throat ripped out and teeth marks all over it. I am talking about werewolves we jumped right into it so how are you doing that's what we're doing yeah I'm, we're gonna do werewolves but first i want to know how uh are you planning to spend your octara fest well i mean i know at least three days this month i'll be spending it chained to my dungeon for the safety of others for real though why don't you share with folks some of your Octera plans. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're extremely different from other months of the year in which I consume unhealthy amounts of horror-themed content, um, watch a bunch of movies, read a bunch of books, play a bunch of games, and spend as much time with beloved co-host as my energy levels and work schedule will allow. Well, I'll tell you how I'm spending a terror fest this year. Uh, obviously making great pod content and some bonus odes. Look out for mm. those bonus odes on special Friday the 13th and Halloween on Tuesday, our podcast day. But this we're going to have a special bonus ode for you. This is like leap month for, you know, yeah, it's this like is, leap year this for is October. like Christmas for horror it's amazing and all these things are happening people. i have plans to go to a uh, haunted house excursion Ooh, can i come maybe mm. and also uh i have plans to apple it up apple and cinnamon oh, it up yeah for sure for sure you know the weather has immediately frozen here and <laughs> in one of our luxury properties and unfortunately we're getting remodeling done on our warmest most remote property that we will probably be stuck I'm in the frigid you, property that those, we are recording from thusly. You can hire as many crews as you want, Laura. Those bloodstains are not coming out. So now that we've said hello. Hello. Now we can jump back again and jump forward. Friends. To this here episode, a howling good time. Werewolves. Is the moon... As full as your belly is of the raw meat you consumed in a trance-like state? Um, so, anyway, uh, werewolves, where do they come from? That's a great question. And it's spelled werewolves, not W-H-E-R-E. -E. Thank you. So it's not where do werewolves come from, it's where do werewolves come from. Oh, goodness. Um, so anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about the folklore of where wolves come from. <laughs> I'm just hoping this ends. I'm going. It's just going, never going to end, everyone. Going limp. <laughs> so the folklore, you know, it's typically a mythical creature, a shapeshifter. The earliest surviving example of a man to wolf transformation is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yes, from 2100 BC. N thought to be the oldest uh, narrative 
in existence. Yeah, absolutely. And werewolves, as we know them, first appeared in ancient Greece and Rome in poetic and philosophical texts. Can I actually go back to Gilgamesh for a second? Because sure. it's worth mentioning the, the the shout out to it's it's not strictly to werewolves. What goes down in Gilgamesh is um, he spurns a would be lover uh, when he finds out that the last uh, booty call she had, she turned into a wolf. Yeah. Which, you know, that's a mood killer. Uh, it was a mood killer in ancient Sumer. It's a mood killer now. <laughs> so uh, as we know them, the, you know, the half man, half wolf uh, iteration in ancient Rome, anyone was a werewolf who was thought to have been uh, anyone that was a werewolf was thought to have come by this by spells or herbs. And they were called turn skins. Nice. That's a great term. Why don't we use that? I don't know. I like skinwalkers. That's a good one, too. Uh, there's a Native American term of skinwalkers yeah. for changelings. That's um, pretty fucking cool. In 1764 and 1766, the beast of Javudan uh, is a historic name associated with a man-eating animal that terrorized the former province of Javudan in South France. Oh, Lots of theories that this beast was a man in animal pelts was rumored, but this animal was said to have killed over a hundred people. They finally, uh, you know, took this animal out, a, a large gray wolf, um, you know, literally like groups of hunters went out to hunt, killed lots of wolves, but finally killed this large gray wolf. Yikes. was said to have been the culprit. Wow. Well, I'm going to um I'm actually going to go back a little further um because I want to get back to the 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 origin of of of, of the actual transformation into werewolf. So uh, you, you may have heard the term uh lycanthrope or lycanthropy, which is I don't know, I guess the medical term for it's a psychiatric condition yeah it is it is um so it comes from the uh, ancient greek leucanthropos which translates into wolfman um now this stems from the ancient greek myth of the king lysan now, lysan was one of like the earliest kings of ancient greece he was king of arcadia and um he was curious if zeus the king of all gods um, was as all-knowing as his reputation suggested he was. So he came up with the completely normal plan to sacrifice his son, Nyctimus, and serve him up as a meal to Zeus and the rest of his family to see if the king of the gods could tell the difference between human flesh and heroes. So um, apparently Zeus was wise enough to tell the difference, but not until he had eaten a bunch of it. So he was pretty pissed off, and he turned Lysaon and his 50 sons, 50 remaining sons, into wolves um, as wow. punishment. So therein came lycanthropes, men turned into wolves. Um, in, in, don't feed your children to gods is the moral of that story. Um, in some European folklore, a uh, man who turns into a wolf at night and devours animals or people and returns to human form by day is really where the werewolf mythology started to take off. And um, there are all different ideas around this. Some can change at will. Others, the condition is hereditary or acquired through curse yeah. um, or being bitten by a werewolf or That's being scratched by a werewolf. Definitely, definitely something you want to avoid. And then some can't. Um, you know, it's an involuntary change. We're talking layers, people. Wear layers. Um, most of the contemporary knowledge and understanding of werewolves comes from pop culture and entertainment, beginning primarily with 1941's The Wolfman. Well, I want to draw a, a very clear distinction that actually comes a little bit earlier than that, um, because the earliest myths of people transforming into animals were purposeful and they weren't necessarily evil. So we're talking uh, Neolithic Stone Age cultures, warrior cultures that would perform shamanistic rites and rituals, often with the aid of psychedelic plants like fly agaric mushrooms. 
um, and work themselves up into a frenzy where they would transform into bears or wolves or jaguars and enter battle into a, you know, in like a drug induced bloodlust. Um, this was very, very probably most well known in the, the, the saga of the Volsungs. Um, much, much later in, in Vikinger raids, the it, Norse. It basically comes from other country where world, wolves aren't common. The animal form that the person turns into is a dangerous animal that people fear in those areas, like a yes, bear or a like, tiger. Uh, Aztec warriors would uh, would work themselves into jaguar forms um, because jaguars prowl the Amazon. Um, so the, uh, the the Viking raiders would... Um, enter berserker rage by taking, um, you know, fly agaric mushrooms and performing their rituals and praying to Thor and Odin and, and all that. And um, they would become berserkers, which were wolfmen or wolfen, wolfen, uh, as they were known. So that was the earlier distinction. Now, in the medieval times, the Christian church did what the Christian church does, and it took pagan beliefs and made them super duper evil. So you've got peasants living in the forest or adjacent to them and fearing the darkness and the shadows and these traveling preachers and priests are telling them all oh yeah skin changers and werewolves and monsters and devils and demons they're all in the woods and come to mass i'll see you on sunday um so that's where the idea of the werewolf that eats your children and attacks villagers started to really come by instead of it being a purposeful transformation it became more of an affliction or a curse but you're absolutely right that basically everything we now associate with werewolves really does stem from the 1941 universal film uh the wolfman which i'm going to be talking a little bit about when we get into our rex well, the wolfman is where it was said that if a werewolf bites you, you have no choice to become part human, part wolf and prey on other humans. And so I just wanted to chat a little bit through some of the common tropes of werewolves and whether or not they apply to our recommendations. Yes. Um, these all are born out of, you know, the movies and books that we've read and some of the folk tales that we've read. And some of them are surprisingly simple well, and maybe unsurprisingly similar to the boundaries placed on vampires you know the ways to defeat them or weaken them they're both susceptible to some common weapons so if you've got them around the house i'm just saying you can fight multiple kinds of monsters so some of those tropes are you know the insatiable hunger for mm. flesh oh. blood and eating yes people and animals and tearing them apart preferably people um, animals in a pinch. The association with the moon. Yes. That they're forest creatures and they hide within like forests and in dark bowels of cities and things of that nature. They have hulking strength. Uh, they go through painful physical transformation. And they heal. They have uh, an ability if they're wounded as an animal to heal. They're also bipedal mostly. Mm -hmm. um, in most depictions, they are not so much wolf as like two-legged wolf-shaped monsters. Yeah. Um, like devils. And then we have the silver. Silver is a common ward against evil throughout mythology. Works on vampires. And it's been fictionally used to kill many types of creatures including werewolves and the reasoning behind it being an Achilles heel for werewolves varies from story to story. Some stories say that silver poisoning um, within like the blood of a werewolf or shooting one in a heart with a bullet is the fastest way to contaminate their bloodstream. Um, in other legends, uh, they say that the it's a bloodborne virus that silver can kill or cure due to its antibiotic properties. Hmm. Silver has also been attributed to the moon for thousands and thousands of years. Oh, yes. Which was another reason it affects creatures of the moon. And it's an important property of alchemy as well, which, yeah. you know, was popular at the same time werewolves were. So you've got that. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to jump into some, maybe some some pop culture representations of werewolves that we happen to enjoy? 
you wanted to talk about the werewolf, the oh, wolf right, right. man. So, so um, if we're I, going like in, I say that we go right into the were the wolf man. Let's do it. The Let's werewolf it. of the wolf man. Although, can I just uh, an aside here? Way back in my earlier education and readings of literature, um, when I read Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, I always kind of wondered if there were any allusions to you know it it's a like a werewolf transformation i think it's the similarity being um the monster, the monster inside yeah the the aggression that lies dormant within all of us in polite society coming well he out. does take drugs to get to this point so it's almost like a self-poisoning but it is it's a tragedy, yeah. the, the story, you know. It, but aren't they all? I mean, you're going to talk about the I, wolf man. I and am. It's, victim, it's a victim-based crime. So I'm going to start my uh, recommendations um, into werewolf culture with uh, 1941's The Wolf Man, directed by George Wagner. Oh. Um, yeah. Now, this is the most tragic of my recommendations. Anyone who hasn't seen this might be surprised that this is start to finish absolutely a tragic movie um now lon cheney jr the famous son of lon cheney uh, was it senior yeah no and so lon cheney jr is a very famous uh universal horror actor uh, of the time and in this movie he plays the rare sympathetic character um you know he uh stars as um larry talbot who is an american returning to his ancestral homeland of wales to bury his brother and reconnect with his father, played by the invisible man himself, Claude Rains, also starring Ralph Bellamy. And this is starting to uh, build the group known as the Universal Monsters. Oh, yeah. It, it does. The, the sequels involve other monsters. Now, um, this is the, 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 the sort of first universe building uh, done in filmmaking at the time. Universal mm -hmm. started to pair up Bella Lugosi as Dracula, uh, Lon Chaney as the Wolfman, um, uh, Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster, and Claude Rains as the Invisible Man. And they would cross over into movies. And later on, they became horror comedies where those characters were crossing over with um, Abbott and Costello. Mm -hmm. There was a whole series of films. So, um, yeah, actually, I, I, you kind of stepped on it a little bit, but I, I did want to mention this Aww, stars Ralph Bellamy, who... Um, you might know as Randolph Duke from Trading Places. He was one of the Duke brothers. So if you want to see him uh, as a sort of younger man, he's still kind of like middle-aged in this movie. Um, anyway, so I say this is a tragedy. He, he, this man, Larry Talbot, he returns home. Um, he's back in Wales, and he comes across, uh, he falls in love with a local girl, and he starts to reconnect with you know his ancestral home and he uh, is walking along and comes across a woman being attacked by a wolf mm -hmm. so he beats it to death with his new walking stick that just happens to have a silver uh, yeah. head on it so um the problem is when the police arrive they find two dead human bodies because what happens when you're a werewolf and you die as a werewolf you transform back into your human form so Larry Talbot becomes suspect number one because he said, I killed this wolf that was killing this girl. Um, now, he starts to feel weird and things start to happen. It involves pentagrams on people's hands, which is something I haven't seen in any other wolf tales. But the coolest part, in my opinion, is this Romani woman, Maliva, who um, kind of is the first one to tell him, oh, no, you got bit by a werewolf and you are going to turn into one. Um so it's a it's a tragic tale in that he does start to realize that that is definitely happening to him. Mm -hmm. And he tries very hard to leave town before he hurts anybody. He has to leave the love of his life. He has to leave his father. Um, unfortunately, dad of the year, Claude Rains, says, no, you're crazy. And he ties him to a chair during a full moon. And that goes as well as you'd expect. So anyway, Larry Talbot doesn't make it to the end of this. And I want to point out this script... This was written by Kurt Siodemak, who was a writer from Germany who, who wrote this, and he wrote the novel Donovan's Brain, which is a famous book about a disembodied brain that um, starts to influence people to do its bidding. But um, it's a beautiful, 
screenplay. This is a, it, this movie really works because it plays the the werewolf very much as a curse, very much as something unasked for, undeserved. It's not inflicted upon people that had it coming. It's just random. And Larry Talbot gets cursed with this by trying to do the right thing. So the uh, Maliva, when um, when Larry Talbot is dead and is turning back into his human form, and everybody realized, oh God, we just killed Larry, not 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 the yeah. wolf. She says, because they always go back to their form. Yes, and I just want to. What this is what she says: the way you walk was thorny through no fault of your own. But as the rain enters the soil, the river enters the sea. So tears run to a predestined end. Your suffering is over. Now you will find peace. Holy shit. Wow. That is deep. Yes. I very much recommend this movie. Now, it does not have the transformation effects that we're going to be talking heavily about in our other recommendations because that really comes to define what makes an awesome werewolf movie. Um, this is more, you know, kind of fading into a human looking guy with a beard. Um, but it's the performances in the script of this moody little movie that is so moving um, and touching and really, really plays the successful aspect of this is a terrible thing that happens to people that don't deserve it. Yeah, which, it's very much a curse in yeah, that film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's not always the case in werewolf movies. No, it's um, not. It's and it's interesting kind of to rarely me. Rarely the case, actually. It's interesting to me that the proto movie that that came to define, you know, like the popularity of werewolves, was this very measured, almost Shakespearean tragedy uh, of a doomed man, um, played by Lon Chaney Jr., who usually played the snarling villain. So yeah. very, very cool all around. Honestly, I just rewatched it for the first time since I was a kid, and. Yeah, it's a movie from 1941, but it fucking holds up. Awesome. Well, now we're going to get in the old Zoomy machine and go to 40 years later, 1981. Which was, and we'll mention this, a banner year for werewolves. Yeah. So I I'm going to start out by saying this, and this all my recommendations and some of my mentions, this applies to. I don't think it's been really well executed to have a believable werewolf film. Well, you're not wrong there because for every dozen vampire movies, there's like a single werewolf movie. There is it's it seems really challenging with the actual monster of it all um cuz you know, a good werewolf movie includes some method of transformation and i have to say that this movie this 1981 movie has an incredible transformation scene i think actually i would argue that the success of what you're about to discuss is what has placed the pressure on most following werewolf movies because they felt like they needed to replicate this once in a century incredible moment of practical special effects yeah so american werewolf in london oh yeah directed by john landis noted child killer makeup and um you know special effects artist rick baker oh god he's done a lot of werewolf movies can, can he's we like just yeah real quick can we he's oscar winning i think oscar winning makeup artist can we do an episode on vfx sure. artists like tom savini Stuart gordon all those do i mean my gosh and it's starring griffin dunn yeah who you listen you all know and love um most recently did a stint in the television show This Is Us. Yes. As Uncle Nicky. Yeah. Not, and he was incredible. Not his normal um, bailiwick. Um, and also starring David Naughton, who was in a lot of early 80s films and has had a pretty you know steady career but i would say this is probably his most known part he absolutely was also in midnight madness which is a secret love 
of mine. Oh, yeah. I love yeah. that movie so much. It's so great. That's a bananas movie. Um, yeah. And this is a bananas movie. Um, so just to give you a quick little overview, two best friends go backpacking in England. Um, and they end up being attacked by a creature of the night. One of them dies. Spoiler alert. It's Griffin Dunn's character. And he ends up being like this haunting zombie which has incredible like destructive like yeah so decomposed makeup only, only his friend can see him only his friend can and see he him. only appears like all ripped up to shit yeah by this so wolf. it's amazing yeah so he's disgusting to look at yeah and he keeps getting disgusting and yeah. david naughton gets attacked and lives and ends up in the hospital we know what that means and starts to feel like something has changed one of the things uh, that's thematic throughout this is American tourists abroad not listening to the advice of the locals. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again. No matter how grimy and crazy and gnarly the locals are, when they tell you don't go into the moors at night. Yeah. They go into the Fucking this, don't do it. They go into this country pub. Everybody's super quiet and weird. And, and that's are, the other thing. This this whole idea of like everybody acts like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. But basically, one guy in the pub warns him, you know, beware of the full moon and stay on the road. And they don't. They like immediately don't. They don't. Yeah. Um, it seems like a very, very simple ask. And and one you should do anyway. His best friend, the de- decaying Griffin Dunn, tells him, tells David Naughton's character, um, you got to be careful. You're going to turn into a werewolf at the next full moon. And he it completely ignores him and falls in love and hooks up with the nurse, moves in with her when he's discharged from the hospital. And then... Which happens... To everybody that goes to <laughs> the hospital, right? His friend keeps right? getting, like, grosser and grosser. He begs him to kill himself before the next full moon, which, again, he doesn't. And then he turns into a werewolf through one of the most amazing yes. cinematic physical changes into and a werewolf this form. this is the moment that I think doomed most werewolf movies that followed because... It set the bar so high. And I think the mistake that a lot of filmmakers have made since then is believing my movie has to match this moment when you're just not going to. Yeah. You are not going to beat this moment. Right. That's a wear cycle. Cycle of the werewolf. There you go. That's the cycle Holy of the shit. werewolf. The motorcycle of the werewolf. (laughs) Um, So basically he ends up terrorizing London and um, Uh, (laughs) it's just it is a horror comedy. It's hilarious. It's very it's got a it's a cult classic. It's very campy. Griffin Dunn's amazing. He is. He really does make the movie shine. Yes. um, Because of all of his. Like, what does he care anymore? That's really the concept of his character is like. And he like. Dude, you got to kill yourself. Yeah. He really, really is like cynical and, you know, sarcastic. um, And he's like giving his friend a hard time. And then as as things progress, he becomes more like desperate. If I remember it right, too, wasn't he a little apprehensive to to take that shortcut? Oh, yeah. No, he was – obviously, the the one friend that dies is the one who's like, maybe we should listen to literally every local person that said not to do this thing we're doing. And um, David Naughton plays a really good, you know, young, cocky know-it-all. He, he does a really good job, even when he's starting to have all these weird changes. He still thinks that he's the shit. Um. But it is really funny and really great. And I think it did, like you said, set up future audiences with a level of, you know, cinematic expectation on what 
a, an effective transformation of a werewolf should look like and when it's a little overreach, yes. you know? Because yes. I do think that a lot of werewolf movies suffer from it's too far. Also, you've gone too far into the beast they, mode. The problem is, is a, a lot of filmmakers in trying to hit that apex, they spend their entire budget on 10 seconds of a movie to the detriment of the other 90 minutes of the movie. Um, so I think that's where you, you get into the kind of the pitfall. And I'm one of the quick mentions I'm going to, um, talk about later brilliantly sidesteps. This problem has an amazing transformation scene without the need of any special effects. It's really, really cool. So yeah, let's, uh, why don't we take a break and then we'll, uh, come on back for the rest of our transformation. Maybe. Be my victim. I mean customer. Happy Halloween from your friends at Candyman's Candy Van, Chicago's only candy-themed food truck. From Cabrini Green to Lincoln Park, Candyman's Candy Van is just an ill-advised summoning away from delivering sweets to the sweet. Simply find yourself a reflective surface and say the magic word five times. Candyman's Candy Van will appear with all of your favorite holiday treats and a whole bunch of bees. Remember to always bring a friend, as it's a near certainty Candyman will kill at least one of you. But yum yum is it worth it. Remember to tell everyone about Candyman's Candy Van. No, seriously, spread the word or we'll slaughter your whole neighborhood to keep his legend alive. <laughs> I'm being serious. <laughs> Happy Halloween. The candy, I assure you, will be exquisite. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. Candy should be enjoyed without fear of systemic racial trauma or bees eating your eyeballs. Whew. Man, I am back, and my mouth tastes like venison. Weird. No. Ugh. Gross. Neat. Anyway, uh, is it me? I think so. Is it me? My next recommendation is also from 1981, which was, as I mentioned, a banner year for werewolf movies. The third movie that came out that year, which I'm not going to mention, but you totally should watch, is Wolfen, starring Albert Finney and Edward James Olmos, based on the awesome novel by... Noted alien ad abductee, well, Whitley Strieber. Um, so at American Werewolf in London also came out in 1981. So this was a, another classic from horror master Joe Dante, director of Gremlins and Piranha, and mm. also Inner Space, which is a movie I really liked as a kid, and I'm kind of wondering, is it still funny? Because I haven't seen it in a really long time. Maybe. Anyway, um, this is based on the novel The Howling by Gary Bradner, but Dante hired... Indie darling John Sales, who we've mentioned before on this um, pod, to completely rewrite uh, Bradner's script uh, from page one into what we got, which was a semi-satirical send-up of American apathy and kind of sort of pop culture cynicism. So um, in this one, uh, we've got the legendary Dee Wallace. Uh, pause for applause. Yeah. Um, and another collaboration with her uh, that then I don't think they were married at this point. Christopher Stone. Uh, they eventually did get married until he died in, I believe, 1995. Um, and during that time, Dee Wallace was known as Dee Wallace Stone. She went back to being Dee Wallace after he passed. This has a great cast. It also stars Slim Pickens, Kevin McCarthy, who we've mentioned a few times also was in inner space, by the way. And John Carradine. Mm. Um, so Dee Wallace plays Karen White, who is an, uh, mm. a, a journalist from uh, Los Angeles who is horribly traumatized when the police have her help them lure her stalker uh, into a porno theater um, where he sits behind her and then she turns around and screams and the cops rush in and... She suffers amnesia and terrible trauma from this because ACAB, am I right? So um, fucking her therapist sends her and her husband to a place called The Colony. Now, folks, if you tell your therapist I had a bad week and they say, why don't you go to this place called The Colony you for a while? You gotta get a new therapist. Don't go. So they go to The Colony, which 
in 1981 is exactly what you think it would be. It's basically just a campground with a bunch of people. I mean, the therapist with, is in on it. Yeah, they're fucking and doing drugs and, uh, you know, healing, but not really. And also there's a werewolf. So the werewolf attacks people and they people change. Now, this movie, the effects were done by another legend, Rob Botton. And God damn it, if American Werewolf in London hadn't come out the exact same year, this is the movie everyone would be talking about because the transformation in this movie is phenomenal. It is almost as good. It is heartbreaking, the ending. Yeah. Um, because Dee Wallace plays an innocent character. This is very much another story of the, the werewolf myth being a curse. But what separates this movie is, like I said before, it's very much a send-up of American apathy. And... It's basically like Network, the movie Network, but if um, Peter Finch turned into, turned into a werewolf on camera and started yelling, like, the moon is full as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Um, <laughs> it's really about American consumerism and the way we, we get our information, truth versus disinformation. Yeah. Is that familiar to anybody? Also, um, you know, uh, when people group think fear yes yes thing. mob mentality mm-hmm. mob but mentality. also the 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 ending of this movie is very much here's all the information you need world werewolves exist what are you going to do about it and like we've seen oh so many times in real life that makes no difference at all no one gives a fuck no one they just go back to their tv dinners and their dumb little lives and their dumb concerns and you know that's fine so it's a great movie. It's definitely an experience um, because it, it the tone can sometimes be a little hard to lock down. You're like, is this supposed to be funny? Is this supposed to be serious? I would say it's much more serious than funny. And in like terms of funny, comedy. yeah, it's more like satire and dark humor and biting humor and, and than like American Werewolf in London, which is legit funny. Yeah. Um, but – like American Werewolf in London, this is also very violent. Mm-hmm. So these are legit horror movies we're talking about. Um, I really, really enjoy this movie. D. Wallace's performance, specifically at the end of the movie, you're going to see a werewolf do something that you don't typically see werewolves do, and it brings a humanity to the 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 human side of this monster. You know, yeah. we so often focus on the the, the wolf side. But it is part human. Well, I think a lot of the films represent the as the wolf comes out, the humans no longer inside. But maybe what you're talking about is they were uh, D. Wallace was able to access the man inside. Well, them. actually, it, it, another difference in, with this movie than a lot of other werewolf movies is werewolves are usually male figures turning into wolves in in, in, our, in pop culture with the exception being you know ginger snaps uh, obviously i have a few examples actually yeah. we're going to talk about that aren't but when you see werewolves from from some movies it's an expression of like rage and inner anger and machismo um and and feral attitudes animalistic but yes d wallace is both a woman and a reporter so her response to turning into a werewolf is one of curiosity and I need to get to the bottom of this, and I need to inform mm. people. People need to know about this. She's not trying to chain herself up or save somebody. She's trying to, like, tell the world that I am, you know, the, the werewolves are real. You need to know about this. Um, so it's it's definitely a different perspective than other movies I I had watched for this um, for this episode. But The Howling, 1981 – Shit, what a year. Three yeah. awesome werewolf movies. I mean, I, I don't think that's ever happened again. Um, well, definitely not with the awesomeness of it. Um, Ooh, spicy. So I'm going to talk about a book next. Cycle of the Werewolf by our favorite Stephen King. Oh, um, it's a quick one. Came out in 1983. Love that book. It's illustrated and it's laid out it's month big. to month. It's like a big book softback book you know like large yeah it's not the size of a paperback no i mean it's not at the a time it's not it's like, like a mass a, market a paperback paperback and a half i remember that in the library that it was larger yeah. than the other books yeah and it it's basically about this town tarker mills which is a budding dairy and all of the other fictitious towns that Stephen Man, king has created even the towns next to dairy have a fucking hard i know time. um and it's being hunted 
you know, the townspeople are being hunted by a werewolf and each chapter of the the book is a month on the calendar and every full moon the chapter takes place. So every month, the full moon, the werewolf goes out and kills one of the townsfolk and they talk about it in great detail. I mean, Stephen King writes about it in great I mean, detail. imagine in your small town in Maine, someone is killed every month. Yeah. And the protagonist of the story, Marty Coslaw, is 10 years old. He's in a wheelchair. And it, the stories go back and forth between the horrible incidents of his days living in Tarker Mills as a 10 year old and um, how it affects him and how it affected him throughout the rest of his life. So um, when fall comes around, so does Halloween and a terror fest. And so Marty goes trick or treating. We look forward to all year people. Marty goes trick or treating with his dad while he's out. He goes to the Reverend Lowe's house um, who's a local Baptist preacher and he's wearing an eye patch. And so uh, Marty has already had a confrontation with the werewolf that involved a firework in the eye. And so Marty is wearing a Yoda mask and he realizes who the town's werewolf is right then and there. Yeah. Um, and it really describes like how afraid he was and how he when he gets home, he's basically panicked. And, you know, props to Stephen King for having a really consistent opinion of Baptist preachers. Well, they the family didn't know, didn't he didn't know it before this time because they're not the, the family was Catholic. So they never went to the, the church, yeah. which I think is a really interesting reveal because Marty's in a mask. The preacher is essentially in a mask. Oh, yeah. And the the realization of that. And so Marty starts to send these like threatening letters to him and then asks his uncle Red to come and help. So his awesome uncle. Yeah. So uh, this is a twofer um, because I'm going to go right into the 1985 film that is based on this Silver Bullet directed by Dan Atias. This was the first and only film directed by him. And for the rest of the 80s, he mostly directed TV shows. But he's never made another theatrical film, which is a shame because I think this film was great. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, usually it only happens when somebody makes a like a real stinker. But this movie's good. And it, the screenplay was written by Stephen King. So yeah, how yeah. The, the novel doesn't follow the same format of the book. Um, it's narrated by Marty's sister, played by uh, Megan Follows, and Marty is played by Corey Haim. Mm. And he's, R.I.P. Corey. Oh, he's so wonderful. This was, you know, really the emergence of, you know, the Corys. Yeah, because this is like, I think one year after Corey Feldman's debut in one uh, year Friday, later, I think. No, oh, 19, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, part four. Well, I think the following year, Feldman is in Stephen King's Stand By Me. Yes. So, yes. you know, this is really, and the Corys became an 80s, 90s phenomenon dream for all dream. people. All people. Um, it also stars Everett McGill as Revan Lowe, Gary Busey as Marty's uncle. Oh, Red, yes. And Terry O'Quinn, a young Terry O'Quinn as the local sheriff. Yes, yeah, the stepfather himself. Um, and listen, for, for our younger listeners, um, I do want to mention that there was a time when Gary Busey was an Oscar-nominated legitimate actor and ostensibly, quote-unquote, regular person. Uh, this is before his uh, mental illness and substance abuse was uh, exploited and monetized for ratings. But he used to be just an actor in movies. Absolutely. And he was good. I want to I want to point out in this film a couple of scenes. One of the scenes is a dream sequence had by Revan Lowe of where all of the parishioners in the church slowly turn into werewolves and basically start to accuse him of being a monster and he wakes up and we don't 
quite know that it's him yet. We sort of find out when Marty finds out. We find out a little earlier because we see the eye situation. Um, but that that's the other part is when he and his sister go around to all of the neighbors' homes selling something to try to get a shot of who has an eye patch. And listen, and when the, Everett McGill yeah. as the oh, Reverend, he's so good, fucking awesome. He's now, Everett so McGill good. is probably best known as playing um, Big Ed on uh, Big or Big Earl. Is it Big Ed or it's Big Ed on uh, Twin Peaks? Mm, mm-hmm. um, so he's a very big, distinctive-looking dude, and yeah. in this movie, he is terrifying. Yeah, and it's, it's and, really and it's all seen casting. from the perspective of like a child, so he's even bigger, you know. And Gary Pusey really plays Uncle Red. They originally um, were going to cast John Candy as Uncle Fascinating. Red. Fascinating. But Gary Busey had this really unique take, and he had a, a, a strong kinship with this character. And so he was allowed, he after like sort of, you know, asking in his Gary Busey way, he was allowed to ad lib all of his lines in certain takes of each scene. And... He also did some scripted takes, but Stephen King and the director, David Daniel Addis, Attias, I think, um, like the ad lib scene so much better that that's what made the final cut. That's awesome. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Gary Busey used to be an actor, but also I can't picture Uncle Buck as Uncle Red. No. Uh, because Red is who I actually think Gary Busey An was like. Mess. Now I know why. Because he ad-libbed and made up all his lines. That essentially was Gary Busey. Yeah. When you watch this movie, if you know anything about, about Gary Busey, the reason he's so good at Uncle Red is because he basically fucking is Uncle Red. So one of the other parts that I wanted to mention, because we did talk about um, that earlier beast of Jean Vaudin, like, you know, story. yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a there's a nod to that story in this film um, where Marty and Jane give their silver medallion and cross to their uncle to get it made into a silver bullet. It's a reference specifically to how some of the townsfolks got those silver bullets made to go hunt. This you know, I forgot to town. mention this when you brought that up. But in uh, in the 16th century, there were actually multiple serial murderers in France who claimed to be werewolves. Um, yeah. There were a series of trials, and they were almost all burned at the stake because that was basically the answer for everything. Yeah, um, I do think but, that there's like a little uh, trope of uh, that werewolves don't like fire. Look, there was... Oh, yes, yeah. And there was something going around in France in the 1500s, let's just say. Yeah. Um, so, so that's uh, that is Cycle of the Werewolf and Silver Bullet. Uh, I recommend doing a... A read you'll read it in one sitting. Oh, it's so it's a really short book and then watching the film which i think you can get on prime it is fantastic it mm. holds up although the actual wolfing makeup may not be the highest caliber i think that um the the story and the heart behind the story and marty's sort of like I mean, he's just so adorable. Yeah, and also, and the what silver Uncle bullet Red himself. What Uncle Red does to the wheelchair is yeah, which is his wheelchair is legendary. It's it's amazing. great in the book. It's even better in the movie. I mean, just the, the Marty's face as he sneaks out of his house to drive the silver bullet down country roads in the yeah. middle of the night, really fast. Props to Stephen King is for heart right there. His he has always been. It, you know, maybe to varying degrees of success, but inclusivi- inclusivity um, and representation has always been important to him. Writing characters with disabilities as people, not as people with disabilities, but people. Yeah. Um, people first, characters first. And this is an aspect of them and informs their lives and is part of their lives. But I mean, Marty's very much. A ten-year-old boy. First. Yeah, and he annoys the he annoys his sister, and his yeah. sister is like, "I hate you." Oh so yeah, she's, much. she's mean to him. Yeah, just like a brother and sister would, especially eighty. And sisters, so man. it's sort of like he's not being treated differently. Yes, which is normalization. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that what's is your awesome. Next one. My last movie oh. recommendation is my most fun. Uh, this is 2002's directorial debut of the. 
usually great, sometimes not, Neil Marshall. Um, and I'm talking, of course, about Dog Soldiers. Now, this movie is solidly a B-film, but I'm mentioning it because it's a lot of fun, it is balls to the wall, and it's got a pretty great cast. So balls this movie, to the wall. Yeah, wow, listen, what it's, an endorsement. This movie is like, it's an action, military, explosion, werewolf movie. Yeah. So um, it stars Kevin McKidd from Train Spotting and some show about doctors. Um, uh, he's playing an SAS, a special air service wannabe. He was like British Special Forces. And he fails his induction into the special services by refusing to shoot a dog in cold blood. Oh. Uh, that was his last last part of his test is, you know, you got to follow all orders and he doesn't follow that one. So he stays a regular soldier. So flash forward, he takes his team out on a mission into the woods to find another team. But what they find is Liam Cunningham, the Onion Knight himself, sole survivor and very fucked up at this point, ranting and raving about what attacked them. I feel like he's going to be doing the same exact thing in Last Voyage of the Demeter. Probably. So, (laughs) Ranting um, and raving about what attacked them, being a sole survivor. With, With a great accent. Uh, it was came out of the dark. It did. Um, so, Liam Cunningham. They they, they 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 take him to this house where the, the the soldiers all sort of kind of reconnoiter and they try to figure out what's going on. And um, that's when they find out that their unit was bait. So their unit, which also has Sean Pertwee in it. Uh, I said great cast. So um, they were sent out by the British government as bait to attract a live werewolf, which Liam Cunningham's unit was going to capture. Only they got attacked by werewolves first. Oops. So when they find out, they decide they're going to kill Liam Cunningham. But unfortunately, that's the same time that two things happen. The moon comes out, and Liam Cunningham does what people who get bitten by werewolves and don't die do. So uh, he fucks them up pretty good. And then the rest of the movie kind of turns into this siege film where they fortify the house. And listen... This is a B-movie, okay? The effects can be a little rough sometimes, but they are practical, and they're pretty good. The acting is a lot of men screaming at each other and doing manly things like yelling, Go! No, I won't leave you behind! Go, you son of a bitch! That kind of thing. And, you know, explosions. But it's... Jeff Winger, you son of a bitch. Basically, yeah, it's got a real, like, Predator vibe to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Listen, this movie's a lot of fun. Neil Marshall is a legit talent, even though he he has suffered a bit lately. This is like, if you watch this movie and then you go and watch The Descent, which has an all-female cast, it's a really nice pairing, honestly, Mm -hmm. because this is like a very macho type movie. And then The Descent explores female rage and female, um, you know, deception and the way that their dynamics work. Um, So a lot of the same themes, but this is definitely my fun rating the wolf of effects are are like i said it's good that neil marshall knows how to use shadow <laughs> to cover up certain things but this movie's great for what it is crack open uh, a, an, an adult beverage and and watch this you will not have a bad time it's um got a lot of heart and it's violent as shit and it's really fun in my opinion to watch kevin mckidd in anything that isn't gray's anatomy i love you kevin mckidd please do other things do other things. I don't yeah, want to watch that show. The Malibu I, know, Beach I, just, I don't want to watch that show, but that's all he's in. And he's not great in it because that show's not great. No, he's so good in everything else, though. Um. So my next and final recommendation is a book. What? And it's called Sharp Teeth. Oh. It's from 2007, and it's written in wow. free verse, and the author is Toby Barlow. Fascinating. So... Um, it really plays into the lycanthropy yeah, yeah. of the uh, sort of illness of identifying as a werewolf. Um, so it, the, the, the work is in a couple of different parts and it follows three packs of shape-shifting dogmen <laughs> that live in Los Angeles they identify as dogs, but they appear as humans to others. And the three packs essentially become rival gangs of each other in an effort to control 
Los Angeles. Um, they don't adhere to any traditional rules because they're all descendants of lycanthropes. So they didn't get this by like any curse or being bitten by someone else. It's all their ancestral um, like path. Um, and they can change any time they want. Uh, there's only one woman allowed per pack and she links herself typically to the alpha and i heard she's a real b this story really is the story of lark who is a dominant alpha in one of the packs and his girlfriend betrays him and then another pack leader basically emerges within that pack and then anthony who's a dog catcher and falls in love with lark's ex and they want to run away together. And it's really, it, it's a really interesting story about this female werewolf who's fallen in love with this dog catcher, her old alpha still pining for her, these rival gangs and the other females in the gangs trying to take down this female who left her pack. So basically, if you want a story about like werewolf culture, but you don't want to destroy your brain by watching the Underworld series, read this book. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's a really interesting take on contemporary, you know, werewolves, how um, groups of individuals. They, they are pack animals. Fight, yeah, yeah. Fight with each other and how love and safety and protection and community really comes into play. Hmm. Um, so it's a really interesting work. I mean, I, I wouldn't reduce it just to a werewolf book, but it definitely is a modern take on it. And I really like that it was free verse. I thought that was really like fun and interesting. Um, so check that out. I do want to talk about one other thing before you go into your quick mentions. Let's do it. So there's a film that I'm not recommending. Oh, gosh. I can't believe you even watched this. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it. It is, first and foremost, a comedy. Um, I guess. Although I didn't think it was that funny. Um, uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is uh, it came out in 2005. It was directed by Wes Craven. His, That's pretty much why last, I'm bringing it up. His last movie. Here's where it starts to go wrong. Written by Kevin Williamson. Ugh. And it stars, top build stars, Christina Ricci. Okay. Jesse Eisenberg. Mm -hmm. Portia de Rossi. Wow. Shannon Elizabeth. Joshua Jackson. Nick Offerman. Judy Greer. And Derek Mears. It, oh, as I mean, the fucking, werewolf. Derek motherfucking Mears in anything is amazing, obviously. So... I'm not going to even waste your time telling no, you sucks. what it's about because it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Milo Ventimiglia is in it too. Yes. Yeah, like fucking everybody's in this movie. That's part of it. So everybody's in this movie. Maya, the singer Maya is in it. Um, so, you know, it's Kevin, very much Kevin Williamson, very much the early aughts uh, with the music and the attitudes. And it is... It's unwatchable. Stupid. No, listen, I saw this <laughs> when it, as soon as it came out because Wes Craven, had, you know, it's his last movie and Christina Ricci was top build. So obviously I'm going to watch it. And I remember being so bummed out by it. Yeah, you'll never, ever hear probably any of this cast talk about being in this movie. It just doesn't on any level work. Yeah. So that's La Lance Bass is in it. And Craig Kilborn and Scott Baio. So Fucking you make sense of everyone. this however you want. Lance Bass and Scott Baio together. Yeah. That's the pairing we always wanted. And so, Craig Kilborn. Jesus Christ. I'm going to jump into a couple of quick things. So I want to mention an amazing book by uh, one of my favorite authors, Christopher Buhlman. Um, Those Across the River. This is a really, really cool book. It um, takes place in 1935. It's very much a Southern Gothic type tale. It's about a failed academic who uh, decides to travel with his wife, Eudora, um, down to Georgia to, uh, to his old family plantation. 
fun. Mm. He's going to write a history book about it because back in the day there was a slave uprising yeah. where they murdered their, Obviously. They, they killed their masters, which uh, I say is good, but um, no one ever goes there anymore. And it's fallen into disrepair. And the reason, spoiler, in this episode, werewolves. There are werewolves there, obviously. We're, it's an episode about werewolves. Yeah. So I recommend this book because it's beautifully written. Obviously, read Between Two Fires also. That is, it's a totally different book by Christopher Buhlman, but it is his masterpiece in my opinion. Anyway, those across the river, it's it's well written. It's told from the perspective of the main character, Frank Nichols. It's largely about his failures as a man, um, the failures of his family. Once you discover the secret behind the plantation, it, it, it's certainly a complicated narrative mm. as anything involving a plantation in the Deep South uh, uh, would be. But the ending is rather lovely in a way. It's, it's um, certainly haunting, and I am not sure what to make of it, but there is an element of it that is beautiful and terrifying. Yeah. I will say um, it's a just a it's a it's a really terrific book in that it is not at all what you expect it to be. Oh, um, now quick honorable mentions. I did mention earlier the Ginger Snap series. There are two films and a prequel. Um, no, I really that is a major, major gap in my film watching experiences. I've actually never seen Ginger Snaps. It has been on my list for 20 goddamn years. Yeah. And I really wanted to watch it for this episode. I just, between managing our luxury properties and being- I mean, no excuses. A you hedonistic didn't, billionaire. But you're, you're, you're basing it on all of the evidence pointing towards it's a good film. I do, I, I am going to watch it. And I'm reinvigorated. Why don't now. you all watch? Why don't we um, have a watch? I want to mention the very, very. It's fun, a Canadian. Horror. It is. It is. And and I'm only mentioning the first one. And a female wrote the script. Yes, that is correct. A female human of the species wrote the script. Um, John Fawcett directed it. Uh, Karen Walton wrote the screenplay. And it's very much about. Um, it, well, it's about two teenage girls and it plays very heavily into the uh, themes of feminism, identity and puberty, which is a great. Um, I mean. It's a great emergence. What two things are dominated by lunar cycles? Wolfdom of the werewolf. It's thing. essentially a movie about menstruation and werewolf transformation. Two things uh, associated with lunar cycles. So I, I can't wait to watch that. I do want to mention very quickly the very very fun Marvel special, um, uh, Werewolf by Night, that was directed by uh, music maestro Michael Giacchino. And I want to mention that it's Gael Garcia Bernal is mm -hmm. in it. He plays. Um, Jack Russell, who is Werewolf by Night. It's a comic book character. It's black and white. It's classic universal style. But in this movie, Michael Giacchino figures out you don't have to nail the transformation scene. It doesn't have to be American Werewolf in London style. It actually happens in silhouette. Yeah, and you can do it in a very small budget. You see it in the expression of other characters' faces. And that, along with the shadows and the sound and the music, makes for a very effective and terrifying transformation scene. Um, and the last quick, quick mention, <laughs> this is a bit of a guilty pleasure for me, is, yes, obviously I'm talking about 1994's Wolf. Directed by oh, none boy. other than Mike Nichols. Yeah, listen, you want to see a middle-aged Jack Nicholson uh, get revitalized with wolf powers? This is the closest you're ever going to come to seeing Jack Nicholson as a superhero, for one. He, like, straight up jumps over building, like, no, huge His fences in this. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, just real quick, he's like a, a flagging book publisher um, who is being usurped by the young cool guy which is james spader by the way um but then he gets attacked by a werewolf and suddenly he's revitalized and he's got all this energy and he feels young and he's powerful and he has an affair with his boss christopher Plummer's daughter michelle mm. pfeiffer so yeah awesome yeah. awesome cast anyway james spader turns into a werewolf too jack nicholson and james spader have like shirtless fights with each other. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. weird and sexy, but also Jack Nicholson's like in his late forties. So it's not that sexy. Um, it is something maybe fifties by this point, actually it's the nineties. So yeah, Wolf 1994. If you want something different, this is that I actually really like it. I'm not going to 
lie to you and say it's a great movie, but I don't know. Pop some popcorn and watch Wolf. You could do worse. You could watch Cursed. Yes, too. you could. Well, you could. That is worse. Um, yes. So do not watch that. Just whatever, whatever you decide to watch. I hope it or trans- wherever you decide to watch uh-huh. it. I hope it transforms your evening into a full moon of horror. And we hope you enjoyed some of our recommendations. And welcome to Octoberfest 2023, everyone. Yeah, enjoy the whole month of terror. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Terror and Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our Terror Fest theme and all other music was written and performed by David Suspanic. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you do, we promise not to haunt you.